having an opportunity to, to read <coughs> God together. Shall we stand and uh, just read together? <laughs> I like us to read together. Isaiah chapter 54. Shall we start reading together? And your gates of capitals, and your and your children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness shall you be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against you shall fall for your sake. Behold, I have created the smith who blows the coals in the fire and who brings forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the west that will destroy. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every time that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servant of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. God bless you. Thank you. That was very good reading. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I like to do that sometimes for, for some people. This is the first time you have read the Bible today. Maybe this week. So it is really a good opportunity. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. So if you read the word of God, you hear it, you believe it, and your faith builds up. So that's, that, that's why we read the, the word of God, because that's how we are built up. We build ourselves up in the most holy faith, and you grow stronger and stronger in faith. I've given the title to this message, 
uh, overcoming the cycle of defeat. Overcoming the cycle of defeat or breaking the cycle of defeat. The word cycle there we know it uh, refers to a pattern, it refers to a habit. Uh, these are things that are repeated over and over again. Somebody was talking to me, I attended a training at some point and they were talking about habits, building habits. And they were saying if you do something 21 times and over, repeatedly, over and over again, it becomes a habit. <coughs> and uh, I found this profound, really, that you do something over and over again, then you naturally find yourself doing it <coughs> again and again and again. And that can be a good or bad habit. So there are things that have happened or that are happening uh, in believers' lives today. Maybe the, from the time you were born, you can look back to your family or to your own life and you see things that are repeated over and over again. I was talking uh, to my wife the other time and I was saying, I look back and I look at my, my mom. She was 16 years old when she gave birth to my brother. And my sister, my younger sister, she was 16 years old when she gave birth to her firstborn. And her daughter was 16 years old when she gave birth to, 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 to her firstborn. So we're talking about three generations here. The same thing repeating. If anybody does not see a pattern in that, then they, they need help, you know, to see that there is something that's repeating. So these are things that you can see in your family. Patterns can be uh, in different, different, different ways. But I want you to know today that God's plan for your life is to live a life of victory. Amen. God's plan for your life is for you not to be defeated. Because Jesus rose, he died and he rose from the dead for this very reason. So he doesn't want you to be defeated by the enemy. If you look into your Bible in the Old Testament, especially particularly during the time of the judges, that God raised judges, there is uh, what is called by scholars the sin cycle. So the sin cycle was a pattern where the children of Israel would go into sin, they would commit sin, they would rebel against God, God would raise a deliverer. They would, he would raise a judge, people like Deborah, people, people, like, people like Deborah, people like Samson, uh, you know, people, pe people like uh, Gideon, uh, all those people were deliverers whom God raised to deliver the children of Israel from sin. So after they'd seen something would happen, they would be routed by the enemy. Their enemies would come and pound on them, the Philistines and uh, all their different enemies, they would be defeated, uh, their armies would be defeated because they rebelled against God. And God then raises a deliverer. And this deliverer will deliver the children of Israel uh, from, from the enemy. And then they go back into sin and the same pattern would repeat over and over again. <coughs> I want you to look at your life today to really be open to God about your life. Look at the patterns. Some of them could be patterns of sin. Something that repeats over and over and you are trying by all means. The fact that you are here in church, it means you love God. It means you want to be obedient to God. It means you want to please God. But sometimes you find yourself being defeated over and over again. This is not God's plan for your life. You should live a life of victory. So you need to see where the pattern is coming from. 
And you've got to be intentional in terms of targeting a, that area. And allow God to give you victory, complete victory. And he doesn't give you partial victory, he gives you complete victory. Some of us may be struggling in areas of finances. We went through that pattern some years ago, and we could see all the time, you know, got a little bit of money, something comes up, and that money is gone. Uh, you know, you get a little bit of money, something comes up, that money is gone. You get a good job, something comes up, and that job is no longer there. And the pattern repeated itself over and over again. Until we grasp that the Bible says, remember the Lord your God. For it is him that gives you the power to make wealth. And you cannot say, my hand, my strength has made me rich. And we said, we've got to remember the Lord our God. So if he has given me something, I need to give back to him and say, God, thank you. Because if this job was not here, I wouldn't have been able even to give. I wouldn't have been able to provide for my family. So we learned the habit of being grateful to God. The habit of giving to God and being grateful and saying, God, thank you for your provision. Thank you for your blessing. The Bible says, give and it shall come back to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So God's principle is different from man's principle. Man's principle says, save and things are going to multiply. God is not saying don't save. But he is saying, give and it shall come back to you. <laughs> this principle works in the kingdom of God, even to people in the world. You know, people who are givers are blessed. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. We need to learn and understand that God does not need your penny. <laughs> he won't be bankrupt if you don't give anything. God is not going to be bankrupt. God is going to say, oh, because they haven't given a penny, or so-and-so is not given, so now my, my accounts are not balancing. You are the one who needs God. You give for you to give glory to God and to receive a blessing from the Lord. I'm not going to really, really, really dwell on this. We are in a church where we've got a pastor who is not really ranting and talking about money. I never said give to, 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 to the church. I'm talking about giving to God. <laughs> giving to God. Give and it shall come back to you. So you give, not that money, you give money, you give your time, you give your life to God, completely to God. And God himself will come through for you. God is faithful. He wants us to be good stewards of what he's given us. <coughs> he's given us children, he's given us family, he's given us you everything. He wants you to be a good steward and say, God, thank you for what you have given me. Amen. There are certain areas that I'm going to really uh, touch on as we move on uh, in terms of these patterns. I talked about finances, we talked about sin, areas of sin. It's a massive struggle. The time that I got born again, I was being routed by the enemy over and over again. I would go back and I would say, oh God, I don't want this. When I was a Catholic, the, the, I would go to the priest crying. <laughs> Look, I, I've sinned again and I'm crying. And the priest said, why are you crying? I'm saying, I'm feeling so bad. I'm feeling so guilty. He say, oh, go and do 10 Hail Marys. Go and do 10 Our Fathers. And I'll go to the fields, I'll be crying there. You know, doing 10 Hail Marys, 10 Our Fathers, 10 Glory Be to the, uh, to the Father and, and all that. And recite those prayers. But that never worked. We are going to look at things that really work according to the scriptures. <laughs> Dealing and breaking that cycle of defeat. 
God does not want you to live in a cycle of defeat, in a cycle of failure. There are areas to do with, you know, your marriage. Some people who are married here have gone through patterns. And maybe there are some people who have gone through patterns, even of divorce. You are in a marriage. And uh, one thing that I learned from the time that I got married is divorce is not an option. So it's not a topic that ever discussed. Even if we had any disagreement with my wife, it's not, a, it's not an option. <laughs> because we learned from day one that the two become one flesh. So if we are one, how are we going to be separated? And the Bible says, what God has put together, let no man put asunder. So we learned from day one that we, we are not enemies against each other, but we have got one common enemy, who is the devil. So we join together and we fight the enemy. <laughs> so your marriage, number four, one of the areas, your children, the enemy would want to destroy your children, would want to attack you through coming to your children, attacking them, causing havoc, causing confusion uh, in, in their schoolwork, in their behaviors. And you also see confusion, areas of attack in your workplaces, relationships, even in church. The enemy wants to come through and attack and cause confusion among brethren. Because he is the author of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. When you see confusion, it's not from God. It's coming from the enemy. When you see discord, it's coming from the enemy. Because the word division, it means two. Die means two. Die, two. And then the word vision. So, so when we come through the word division, it says two visions. Right? So what it means is, in the church, there is one vision. We follow one vision. We follow Christ. So the one who want, the one who wants to bring a different vision is the enemy, and that causes division, chaos, calamity, people fighting against each other because it's coming from the enemy. But your God wants you to overcome. The enemy wants to come through your life, through your circumstances. We are all coming from different circumstances. We all have different circumstances. The enemy knows your areas of weakness. The enemy knows where you are struggling the most. And one of the areas is an area that constantly a priest taught about in this fellowship, which I am very grateful to God for. In areas of sickness, disease, in areas of your spiritual position, so the enemy wants to come through by attacking your bodies, by causing sickness. Check the pattern. You are about to rise up a little bit and they're feeling a little better and the next thing is your ear, the next thing is your neck, the next thing maybe your foot, the next thing is this, your back, the next thing, you have got tummy, you are struggling all the time. It's not coming from God. It's coming from the enemy. And you've got to know that. He's got an assignment to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That is an assignment. His assignment is not to give you life. His assignment is to try and destroy you. But what you want to understand that there is no strategy, there is no formula, there is no weapon, there is nothing that the enemy can do against you as you're long as you're walking right with God. He can attack, but he is not going to defeat you. Because he is a defeated foe. He was defeated right from the beginning. He was defeated on the cross of Calvary. So you are not here to live a life of defeat. 
The enemy will not have a place in your life unless you let him, unless you allow him, unless you open doors through sin, through dis disobedience, you open a door through other things that do not please the Lord. And we read here from Isaiah chapter 54, and it says, Sing, O Baron, hmm. break forth in singing. Cry aloud, you who do not travel with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. So in other words, here we are reading from the prophet of Isaiah, and it's saying, sing, O Baron, you cry aloud, <laughs> you who do not even give birth, you who think, people think according to the natural that you do not have anything. Sing aloud, because the Bible says more are the children of the dissonance than the children of the one who has been married. Dissonation is simply talking about, you know, that person who appears to be abandoned, that person who appears like they have no hope, they have no tomorrow, they are isolated, there is nobody to come through for them. But when they are faithful to God and they are crying aloud to God, God comes through for them. <laughs> you may not have children in the natural, but God blesses you with many more in the spiritual. You may not have material things right now as we speak, but God is your blessing. He blesses you again in the spiritual. There is abundance that's coming forth for you, God blesses you with abundance of everything because he lacks nothing. <laughs> you may not have money in your pocket or in your bank today, but God is your blessing. And the Bible is saying you need to sing aloud. You need to cry for joy in jubilation. Mm. You do not travel with child, but cry in jubilation. Praise the Lord. Give him glory. Give him honor. Don't allow your circumstances to pull you down. Don't allow your situation to pull you down. But what the enemy wants is for you to be despondent because of your circumstances. What the enemy wants you is to agree with the enemy that you are defeated, you are dead. I was saying at one point, I think we went through a rough patch. Uh, in our life, uh, some years ago, I said to my, to my wife, what's the worst that could happen here? Tell me, what's the worst that could happen here? And we came up with the worst, said, this is the worst that could happen. And we said, is this the end of the world? No. So if it's not the end of the world, then that worst which the enemy wants to bring on is not going to pull me down. Because the Bible says, greater is you who is in you than the one who is in the world. Yeah. So in other words, you are more than a conqueror. So even if the enemy comes with his lies, with his confusion, causing havoc in your marriage, causing havoc in your children, what can he do? <laughs> you know, you've got Christ in you who is the hope of your glory. <laughs> he is the hope of glory. So because you've got Christ in you, the hope of glory, it means there is nothing that can destroy you. There is no circumstance that can destroy you. So I'm not going to look at my circumstances, but I'm going to change my attention and I'm going to look at Jesus. <laughs> I'm going to focus on Jesus, even if things are not going as well as I want them to go. Your health you may not be feeling well. Your body may feel battered and destroyed. But that's not the end of the story. Because the Lord wants to bring healing. He wants his name to be glorified through your healing. You remember at one point the disciples were asking Jesus, Who sinned? This boy or his parents? Who sinned? And he said that. This has happened so that the name of the Lord may be glorified. So sometimes your circumstances 
which may look negative, they've been brought by so that God could be glorified through victory. When you overcome that situation, the name of the Lord will be glorified. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, the Bible says, The thief cometh not except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life, and that they may have life abundantly. So you must know it's only the agenda of the enemy to kill, to steal, and to destroy you. That is the assignment. And he is working relentlessly 24-7 to try and destroy you. He does not miss an opportunity you present with him. Because he doesn't give up. He, does, he is almost like I was imagining this morning as I was praying. And I was imagining he is like one of those um, wrestlers. You know, when they're fighting, you can see this one is being battered. And you think, oh, he's gone now, he's bleeding all over, and he's getting up again. And he gets battered, he goes down, and he's getting up again. That's what the enemy is like. He never gives up. He will not give up. <coughs> so even if you are coming from a great victory, don't think he's down and out, he's coming back. <laughs> he comes to kill. He comes to steal. He wants to steal your joy. <laughs> he wants to destroy you, ultimately. He's the enemy of your soul. His assignment is to, to try and destroy you. Take you out completely. Because hell was made for the devil and his demons. And he wants to take as many with him as possible. To hell. But that's not where you are destined. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says, Be sober and be diligent or be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I think God is walking about like a roaring lion, but he is not the real lion. We have got the lion of the tribe of Judah. We're singing, oh God, he's the lion. <laughs> he is the lion of Judah. So the enemy is roaring like a lion. In other words, what he's doing is roaring and causing threats, <coughs> causing havoc. If you've been to those places where you hear the roar of a lion, it looks like the whole jungle, you know, there, there is the echoing all over. That's why he's called the king of the jungle. So that's what he's doing in your life all the time. But the Bible says you must be sober and you must be diligent. And then what must you do? You must resist, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we need to learn the art of resisting the enemy and standing firm. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 that we do not fight against flesh and blood. But we are fighting against principalities. We are fighting against powers, against the rulers of this dark world. You must know that you want to stand firm and also to put on the full arm of God and stand firm against the enemy. You are in a warfare. The day that you gave your life to Jesus, I was sharing the gospel of somebody yesterday. She turned 50 about two years ago, and I said, your best birthday present, if you accept, is you accepting Jesus as the Lord and Savior. And we were sharing the gospel, we were sharing the gospel. She gave your life, your life to Christ. Uh, <laughs> and I said, this is your best birthday present. You can think about the day that you were born, but this is greater than anything else. You have lost five decades. But thank God, God's timing is perfect. <laughs> now you have got Jesus as the Lord and Savior. It means your life 
is going to be different from henceforth. But if you're thinking about you've got an enemy that is always on assignment. So you cannot afford to be complacent. You cannot afford to snooze or relax. You cannot afford to sit back and just say, oh, so nothing to just work. God cannot do good. He cannot do bad. I will just sit back and relax. You have got an enemy who is seeking to destroy you. So you got to stand firm all the time and to make sure all the time you are walking right with God. But what the enemy wants to do is to destroy you. He wants to destroy you. That's his, his assignment. <laughs> and he will not give up. He will keep doing it. It doesn't matter how many years you have been in the Lord. The enemy's assignment is to try and destroy you. You've got to be vigilant. 24-7 he's throwing missiles. 24-7 he's bombarding your territory. 24-7 he's bombarding your children. He's bombarding your workplace. He's bombarding your finances. And what he brings, you want to cause fear? Just watch this. You want to cause you fear? You want to cause you worry? You want to cause you anxiety? You want to cause you panic? And you want to cause you doubt? So that you begin to doubt God. When you become fearful, because he brings threats, he threatens you, you become fearful, it means you are going to worry. And when you start worrying, you are going to be anxious. And when, 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 when you are anxious, what's going to happen? You are going to panic. Like what's happening today, in this day and age, in this country right now, or maybe world over, because of the economic crisis. A lot of people are worrying and panicking right now. It is an open door, and the enemy is looking to power. And the Bible says, we walk by faith and not by sight. So in other words, what, what we need to do in this day and age, we want to understand that we can only live by faith. For the just who live by faith, we can live only by faith. Not through the resources that we have, not through the money we have, not through what people have given us, but we only live by faith in Jesus Christ. The enemy wants to cause strife between you and people. He want to attack even ministries. He want to attack ministers. And I said he want to attack finances. He want to cause mental and spiritual confusion. He wants to bring you down ultimately. But we have got to say no. There is no circumstance. There is no weapon that is formed against you that will prosper. The Bible says God is the one that created the maker of the weapons. <laughs> He's the one that created even those weapons that you can think of. If you were not involved all the way, there would not, there would not be all those great weapons. So he created even the material that was used, the silver. He created it. So in other words, if he is the creator, it means he has got power over everything. So there is no weapon that can be fashioned against you that can prosper against you. Because the greater is he who is in you than the one who is in the world. So there is no missile that can be sent against you that will be successful. He is not saying the missiles are not going to come. They are going to come, but they are not going to prosper. He has given you victory. John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, this thing I have spoken to you, that, to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you have tribulation. So in other words, you have trouble, you will be attacked while you are in this world, but be, of, be you of good cheer because I have overcome the world. The enemy wants to cause you discouragement. One of the greatest weapons that the enemy uses is discouragement. He wants to discourage you. 
When, when it's called you fear, worry, panic, anxiety, he brings discouragement. And when you are discouraged, you think this battle is not worth fighting because you are defeated already. I'm always speaking uh, to, 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 to young people and I'm saying to, to them, look, watch what happens. You lose the battle before you go on the battlefield. When do you lose it mentally, psychologically? I see, you can see the rugby players. They do the war cries before they start the match. What are they doing? They're intimidating the enemy. They're encouraging each other that we are warriors, we are conquerors. You know? And you can see the boxers as well. Before they fight, they go sometimes for days threatening each other that I'm going to eat you, I'm going to eat your children, I'm going to destroy you. <laughs> <laughs> what are they doing psychologically attacking you? Right? You've got no money at home, things are not working, and the enemy is showing you like disaster upon disaster. He's showing you like you are homeless, you've got nothing, and the, you cause confusion, you are worrying, you are panicking. But I say to you earlier on, the question that we ask ourselves with my wife is, what's the worst that could happen? Yes, I have no job. Yes, I have no money. What's the worst that could happen to me now? Right? Because of this situation. If the worst does not mean you being separated from God, then it's not worth you getting into a depression. Mm -hmm. You can't get into depression because of things that you cannot change now. <coughs> there is no reason for it. Because you get discouraged, you become fearful, you start panicking, you open the door to the enemy, and you are <coughs> depressed. Once you are depressed, the enemy now can attack you and bring stress. And when you are stressed, it means, uh, you know, like the, the medical, medical authorities, they even talk about stress being one of the biggest doors that destroy your immunity. And they allow even certain diseases, certain conditions like cancer attacking you. They say stress actually destroys the cancer cells, and the, which means you've opened the door and the enemy can pound on you. It started as a small seed, but you allowed the door to be wide open. Which doors are wide open right now? God has got a plan for you. The Bible says, for I know the plan that I have for you, says God. Plan to prosper you and not to harm you. Plan to give you a hope and a future. God intends for you not to be fearful. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 4, we just read, Fear not, for you shall not be ashamed. God does not want to bring shame to you. He wants to bring victory to you. Neither be you, you confounded. Don't be confounded. For you shall not be put to shame. <laughs> for you shall forget the shame of your youth and shall not remember the reproach of your widow anymore. So it means those times when we are talking about widows, we are talking about people, in the natural people, we have lost uh, the, the husband. It means they are by themselves. But uh, what it means, again, in the spiritual, it means you are in that place where you are excluded from the society. Because in those times, you know, people who are widows were looked down upon, they were not respected, they were not valued, they were not of any importance because they have no husband to protect them. But the Bible here is saying you are going to forget the years of your widow. You are going to forget a widow is constantly crying because they lost their loved one. Sometimes they struggle to get over the grief because they lost their loved one. But the Bible here is saying, I'm going to take away those days of your widow. I'm going to roll away your mourning. I'm going to roll away your reproach. I'm going to roll away that shame. I'm going to put it away, wash it away from you. So in other words, looking at your circumstances, 
God is saying he is rolling away that reproach. Some people have been taken back, thank you Jesus. I've been taken back to those times when you were still a young person and you made a mistake, you sinned against God and the enemy wanted to bring you back to that and say, look at what you've done. Look, God does not care about you because of what you did. And I want to assure you today that we have got a loving God. <laughs> we have got a caring God. We have got a God who is ready to embrace you as long as you are willing to come and surrender to him and say, Lord, I give all to you, Lord. I'm sorry for what I have done. He is a merciful God. He is a caring God. He is a God of restoration. I'm talking today about you overcoming that cycle. Come to the Lord of restoration and he will restore you all those years that were eaten by the cankerworm by the locust, by the caterpillar. He will restore. <laughs> we lived in times, we lived in days that we had no hope about our lives. I gave a testimony last time talking about how the Lord helped us to buy our house and the, I was just saying, we were in a place where in the natural we would not have had any hope that that would ever happen. But God came through. Amen. We continue to trust. We continue to believe. <laughs> we hoped again to hope. <laughs> we hoped even when the situation was looking bleak. Even when the situation was looking like you looked at your money. Okay, how, how do you calculate? Okay, do you qualify for your for the mortgage? And trying to look at the calculator, it was not balancing. Oh, we need about 40 something thousand in deposit. And you are, you are looking at the calculator. How, how many years is it going to take you to raise 40,000? God came through. <laughs> God came through in a way that we cannot today. We are speechless about it. We look back and we say, God, you are faithful. <laughs> to the faithful, he remains faithful. What you need to do is to continue to trust in him, to continue to believe in him, and be faithful yourself. Be faithful. Don't give up. Continue to trust in him. God's plan for your life is not to destroy you. In Job chapter 1, verse 10, we hear about the devil appearing, uh, you know, before God as well. And God is saying, have you considered my servant Job? And he says, if you not put a hedge <laughs> about, round about him and, and his house and everything he had on every side, if you not put a protection around him, <laughs> God puts a hedge of protection round about you. The enemy wants you to see the, how majestic your enemy is. <laughs> the enemy wants want you to see the enormity of your enemy, but not seeing the angels of God round about you. <laughs> this is why, why Elijah had to pray for God and say, God, open his eyes that he may see. He said, more are they that are with us than the ones that are with them. So when the husband's eyes were opened, he saw armies and armies of angels surrounding them, <coughs> protecting them. God has put a head of protection round about you. He doesn't want you defeated. He doesn't want you destroyed. In Psalm 125, verses 1 to 2, the Bible says, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, that shall not be shaken but in Jewel forever. And as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore. Oh, this is what the Lord has done. Mm. Those people who trust in the Lord, they are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. So it means there is nothing that can shake you. There is no financial pressure that can shake you shake you. 
There is no physical health problem that can shake you. <laughs> there is no relationship breakdown that can shake you. You are like Mount Zion, <laughs> which cannot be moved, but will endure forever. This is God's plan for you. And even as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord himself surrounds his people <laughs> from this time forth and forevermore. This is what the Lord is doing. He's surrounding you. As you go out, you may be intimidated by the enemy. You may be intimidated by the enormity of the economic crisis. You may in be intimidated by the immigration issues for those of us who come from other countries. You may be intimidated by all these issues that they are raising. Whose report are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the enemy or you are going to believe the Lord your God who will fight your battle for you? He will rise up on your behalf and fight for you. The Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear him and delivers them. So in other words, he's encamping round about you to deliver you. Oh, test and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you, his saints. There is no lack, there is no want to those who fear him. <coughs> in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5, again, God has promised to be a wall of fire round about him. That you be a wall of fire around him. So when you feel terrified, when you feel scared, you must know that God will be a wall of fire round about you. As you are going out and about, there are times that you say, how did I get out of here? How did this happen? I remember when our son was six months old, I was driving along the M25. Uh, we know the M25 is the greatest uh, car park in the UK, and there was traffic all over. That time I was just too enjoying uh, my youthfulness, I was in my 30s and I was enjoying my driving. I used to really like speeding to the point that, oh, I hope there are no police officers here. <laughs> <laughs> to the point that they sometimes would clock 120 miles an hour going, right? It was, I look back uh, on that day, that changed my life completely. I had Joshua in the back seat. He was six months old. My wife had gone to work. I was driving and I was going in the fast lane and I was really going. And then I realized I was just about to approach the exit. But the speed at which I was going, there was no chance. And uh, on the M25, the exits are very far apart. So I knew if I was going to go to the next exit, it was going to take me maybe another half an hour to come back. So. I said, okay, let me ask for permission from this one in this lane. And this one gave me way, allowed me to come in. But I didn't see the car, which was in the, in the it wasn't the car, it was actually a big truck in the blind spot. It was right, <laughs> right here, the blind spot. So I just crossed right in front of him. He missed me by a whisker, right? And he tried to apply the brakes to the point that there was smoke rising. He stopped about 100 meters away, and I stopped also uh, on the bench for maybe a good five minutes. I, I couldn't understand what had happened. From that day, I learned my lesson. Mm -hmm. Now my wife is complaining all the time. Oh, you're going too slow. <laughs> <laughs> we thank God. We thank God. Right. We'll just quickly go through the solution here to things that we're talking about. Breaking that cycle of defeat. You want to change it to a cycle of victory. I had a friend some years ago, you'd greet him, you go to him and you say to him, Hello brother, how are you? You would say from victory to victory to victory. That was his slogan all the time. 
from victory to victory to victory. This should be our life pattern. We should be confessing victory all the time. We say the battles are coming, but we are here to testify the victory <laughs> through Jesus Christ. Number one, we want to replace stress with peace. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3, the Bible says, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. <coughs> Replace stress with peace. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You want the peace of God to reign in your mind? You want the peace of God to take charge? Pray for the peace of God. Sometimes in the midst of stressful circumstances, worship <coughs> brings down peace. Praise brings down peace. Thank God for the worship team today. You could feel the peace of God, the presence of God. You come here to church sometimes confused, sometimes stressed, sometimes despondent. I know some people that will be coming from night shift and they come straight to work. You come in the presence of God and you sense the peace of God, his presence. Replace stress with peace. If you sleep and you decide to isolate yourself, this is the, the, the strategy that the enemy uses to isolate you from the rest of the people. A lot of people, when they're in trouble, Pastor Dave is always talking about it, they choose to stay at home and not come to church. That's the greatest mistake you can ever make. When you're in trouble, or when you're struggling, this is when you need brethren around, around you. You need other people around you. If you watch wildlife, you can see what lions do. A pride of lions, there could be maybe four or five of them, and there's a head of buffaloes, maybe a hundred buffaloes together. And they want to pounce. Maybe they've not eaten for days. And they are looking for dinner. What they do is they attack. And then the buffaloes start running. And the lions know that if they attack that head, they are going to be destroyed. So they attack, they keep chasing, they keep chasing, and they are waiting for the one that's going to leg behind. And they isolate that one and pass. So this is what the enemy does. Isolating and then <coughs> So don't make a mistake. If you are struggling, if you are feeling unwell, this is the time to be around other people. Number two, rejoice. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, the Bible says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. <coughs> count it all joy. So in other words, you are going through trials. You are going through tribulation. You must know <coughs> that the people who have gone before you, they've all gone through that. But you count it all joy. This is the difference. I've got some people, some friends, who would come to you complaining and murmuring because they are going through problems. Uh, and some people were coming and they were talking about their financial difficulties. Each time you meet them, they are complaining all the time. You're on the phone, they say, oh, you know, this, I was trying to pay this, no, I don't have the money, I don't. So I just said to my wife, listen, they think when we are quiet, everything is sweet. But we have chosen not to agree with the enemy. Amen. We have chosen not to do that. We are not going to complain. You will not hear me memory or complaining about the situation. I trust in him <laughs> who will come through for me. So when you complain and you remember about your situation, you are agreeing with the enemy. The enemy is listening to you. You are agreeing that your situation is bigger than you. It's bigger than your God. But you've got a God who is much bigger than your circumstances. Then number three, take your eyes off your circumstances and look unto Jesus. Watch this. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. 
Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, people, we have gone before us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let's lay it aside and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising his shame, and then sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So in other words, when you are looking at Jesus, he went through the cross, he was despised, he was looked down upon, he was spat on. They say all shameful things against him, but he endured the cross, endured its chain, you know, for your sake. So in other words, the Bible is saying you must be looking unto Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of your faith. Look unto Jesus. He is your solution. He is your answer. Don't look at your circumstances. Take your eyes off your circumstances. Take your eyes off your balance and look at Jesus. Take your eyes off that medical report. Thank you, Jesus. And look unto Jesus. Take your eyes off that situation and look unto Jesus. Take your eyes off those circumstances attacking you and coming against you and look unto Jesus. And number four, uh, James chapter four, verse seven, it talks about therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then we go to the next one, we talked about it. Number six, put on the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter six, verses 11 to 18. Then we lastly, we wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29 to 31. He gives power to the weak. Mm. And to those who have no mighty, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall, shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So in other words, you must wait upon the Lord. Don't give up. Don't give up. Stand firm. Wait upon the Lord. Even if you see other people falling, other people being discouraged, you must wait upon the Lord. And the Bible says those who wait upon the Lord, they will renew their strength. You want your strength to be renewed? You want your confidence to be renewed? You want your faith to be renewed? You want your relationship with God to be renewed? Wait upon the Lord. Sometimes it's good that for you to kneel down and wait upon the Lord and say, Lord, I'm presenting everything. This is my situation. I'm presenting it to you. I'm waiting on you, Lord, to come through for me. And then persevere. Don't give up or give in. James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. <coughs> Persevere. Don't give up. A lot of people have the tendency to give up when things become difficult. They give up too quickly and too soon. They say, oh, that's why you hear people committing suicide. That's why you hear people doing all sorts of things because they've given up. Your hope is in the Lord. Your confidence is in the Lord. You want to break that cycle. Thank you, Jesus. So as we pray this afternoon, allow God to help you to see the pattern, to see the cycle in your life, a cycle of defeat, cycle of failure, and say, God, help me. Help me. And be very intentional. Check your Bible, scriptures about your situation. Address and stand. 
Don't just wait for other people to pray for you. Go through the scriptures. Pray when you're at home and say, God, come through for me. You have promised in your word. This is what you have promised. Shall we stand? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I will pray. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Kuraba Shanda Rabaka Santa. Oh, Kandoribaka Santa. Oh, we bless your name, Lord. Thank you, mighty Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, my God. Rabba Saka. Oh, Shanda Rabaka Santa. We thank you, mighty Father. We praise your name. We worship your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for your word, which is living and active, which is sharper than any double-edged sword. We pray, mighty God, that you come through our situations right now in the name of Jesus. Father God, we break every pattern, every cycle of defeat and failure right now in the name of Jesus. Every circumstance that has been coming repeatedly against your children. Father, we are declaring victory in the name of Jesus. For Jesus, you died for this reason. And I'm praying for breakthrough right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, mighty Father. We exalt your name, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. We are going to pray. Thank you, Lord.